Hello, and thank you for joining us for another pre-concert conversation in our Soundwave series. I'm Ed Parsons, General Manager of the Florida Orchestra, and joining me is our acting principal oboist, Mitchell Kuhn. Welcome, Mitchell. Hello. So this week's, sound, this week's Soundwave's concert features just one piece, Mozart's masterpiece, The Grand Partita. This is scored for woodwind ensemble, 13 players, pairs of oboes, clarinets, basset horns, bassoons, two pairs of horns, and a double bass. And our phenomenal wind section is taking on this monumental work without a conductor, um, as it most likely would have been done in Mozart's time. And so Mitchell, with wind band pieces like this, this sort of large scale chamber music, what, the principal oboe often serves as sort of the de facto concertmaster. Um, as the leader of the group. How is it different in playing in a group of this size um, without a conductor versus mm. you know, having that assistance up front? Sure. Well, it's a very rewarding experience because you're you know, having to work very personally with each musician, um, and you're also having to you know, exhibit a lot of movement and a lot of leadership, uh, and it's very fun. It does present some challenges, especially you know, distanced six feet apart, eight feet apart, distanced feet on apart. stage. Uh, it, it, uh, it definitely makes things more difficult to line up, but uh, I think it'll be a very rewarding challenge to, to surmount. Yeah, and you just had your, uh, we're recording this earlier in the week, and you just had your first rehearsal this morning, and, and how was it playing, playing with the group, making this big sound? It, it, it always is amazing to me the, the amount of sound that comes mm -hmm. out of this, this sized group totally. of wind players with yeah. the bass, and it's just a, such a rich and full mm -hmm. sound. Yeah, absolutely. Especially, actually, I think the distance on stage makes the sound even larger because there's more, like, I don't know, resonating space between us. Um, but yeah, the, our first rehearsal was really, really wonderful. And uh, we got to do a little bit of rehearsal. We did a run through of the entire piece, and uh, it was pretty successful. And we did a little bit of rehearsal, and um, just two movements in like 30 minutes, it, it got exponentially improved. So I'm excited to see how the whole thing's going to turn out. And, and when you work um, with a group within a group like this, uh, is there sort of a, okay, well, Mitchell and David are the leaders and they're gonna be saying stuff or is it more collaborative and everybody gets a chance to, to say things? How does, how does it work practically? Sure, sure. There's, that, that's, that's tough to say because you want everyone to feel like their voices are heard and um, that their ideas are valued and they absolutely are, but at the same time, there does need to be a, a bit of, um, I don't know, consolidation and like, yes, we're, we're doing this now, we're doing this now. Um, <laughs> right. We've so, worked on that enough. Yeah. Let's move on. Yeah, yeah, for sure, for <laughs> sure. So there's definitely a balance to be had. Excellent. So when Mozart wrote this work, he did not call it Grand Partita. He just simply called it a serenade. And these were very common at the time. They were typically used as dinner music for aristocratic parties along with divertimenti and nocturnes. And usually this was just workaday music for composers. A, 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 you know, a duke needed a piece of music for his party and so he would commission a composer to write a piece for a wind band that would accompany his dinner party. Um, and many of Mozart's other surviving scores show this haste this just work a day, well, let me just write something down, but not this piece. Um, we, we don't know exactly when it was written. It had to be written after 1780 because we know from the paper that was used didn't exist before 1780. And we know that it had to be before 1784, which is the only written account of it being performed in Mozart's lifetime. The written account was from a Viennese newspaper accounting of a performance for the emperor in Vienna which detailed a large work of a very special kind. And we also know that Anton Stettler, the famous clarinetist for whom Mozart wrote his clarinet concerto, was one of the performers. And as typical with serenades, there are many movements, seven in this piece. Many are dance forms, perfect for those fancy dinner parties. And it starts out just like a symphony, with a slow introduction followed by a sonata form first movement. Let's hear the very opening, these grand, majestic chords that sort of establish the piece.
The second movement is the first of two minuets. Time to get the party started with some dance music. movement is without a doubt the most famous. If you've ever seen the movie Amadeus, you'll recognize it as the music that Salieri is talking about when he gives this quote. On the page it looked like nothing. The beginning simple, almost comic, just a pulse, bassoons and basset horns like a rusty squeeze box. Then suddenly, high above it, an oboe, a single note, hanging there, unwavering, till the clarinet took over and sweetened it into a phrase of such delight. This was no com composition by a performing monkey. This was mu a music I have never heard, filled with such longing, such unfillable longing. It seemed to me that I was hearing the very voice of God. And you get to play that oboe note. So we have That's this true. sort of squeeze box, bassoons, basset horns, mm -hmm. little horn introduction and then you get to play this one note. And mm -hmm. that's what's so special about Mozart sometimes is that you know, he, one, one long note can be the most magical of anything. Absolutely, yeah. You know, uh, you, you talked kind of about the origins of this, and I've mm -hmm. heard that it was for uh, a wedding, actually his wedding, uh -huh. and I don't know if that's actually true or not, but I like that narrative of a wedding and kind of the opening being very grand, like, you know, ceremony and, you know, there are many moods throughout, but this third movement really feels so, like, uh, so special and like a dearly loving, like, in love sort of way. Um, and it's just very touching to hear. I remember when I was score studying, like, this piece in preparation, uh, I, like, went out to, like, a park, like, over the ocean and I was, like, looking at the score and listening to this and, like, the sun was setting and there was a tear in my eye. And it, was, <laughs> it was just like, I was like, wow, this is, this is great. Well, with that image, let's hear the beginning of the third movement. The fourth movement is another minuet and trio, this one a bit shorter, and Mozart makes a little inside joke here, scoring the trio section for only the oboe, basset horn, and bassoon, a trio playing the trio. <laughs> the fifth movement is a romance, and that title refers to a lyrical type of piece of music, perhaps this idea of literal romance. The sixth movement is a theme in variations, and this is where composers get to flex their creativity, showing many ways of interpreting a simple theme. Mozart's theme is stated by the clarinet and is eminently hummable. Mozart praised the clarinet over all other woodwind instruments for its ability to mimic the human voice, in particular Anton Stettler, who he uh, considered one of the greatest singers through his instrument. Um, so it was a logical assignment. And there are six variations on the theme, taking all manner of characters, ending in a lively waltz. Let's hear the opening uh, of this theme of variations. And so now we've come to the finale. The last movement is in a lively rondo form, bringing the party to a rousing close. I'd say this is probably, we were talking about this, this is maybe my 
favorite movement. I mean, it's, the, the piece is, is quite long. It's uh, 45 minutes to 50 minutes um, in these seven movements. So for Mozart, one of the longest pieces he had written, aside from his operas, of course. Um, so tell me a bit about what, uh, what it's like to play a piece like this of such length mm -hmm. um, as a wind player. You know, we, we get tired fairly quickly, um, so I assume light reads um, yes. and in order to get through it. Um, yeah. But so how do you sort of manage your stamina mm -hmm. as a wind player playing a monumental piece like this? Sure, uh, a lot of preparation. Uh, having the right reads, if you don't have the right reads, like you're sunk in the first movement if you're playing on a, on a read that's too heavy. So, so kind of your priorities shift to uh, endurance and marathon running um, as opposed to like one solo as, as you might sometimes in the orchestral repertoire. Um, so making a ton of reads, doing a lot of uh, playthroughs, having a very specific map of where you're breathing, um, and also just generally knowing the score really well and preparing kind of mentally just knowing the piece and knowing how long it is and where the tough stuff is, where the stuff you can lay out is. And that way you kind of trust that you know where you are in the grand scheme of things and that you can make your way through it. And we should say um, that if you are unable to make the Soundwaves concert, you should definitely come and hear the Masterworks concert because Mitchell is doing double duty this week, um, performing Albinoni's Concerto in D minor for oboe and strings on the other programs. So not only do you have to play this mammoth, almost hour-long uh, Mozart Grand Partita, you're also playing, albeit fairly light, concerto, but a concerto <laughs> nonetheless. Yes. <laughs> yes, which I'm sure, we haven't played it yet, but I'm sure that's going to be fantastic. Um, so have you, have you ever performed this, uh, this piece, Grand Partita? No, I haven't. I've played every other uh, Mozart wind serenade, though, so I'm very excited to, uh, to finally do this one. Right. Well, it is pretty rare um, to hear Mozart's Grand Partita. It's been played quite a bit, actually, this season because it's one of those pieces that you can do um, that uses wind players, that's not too many wind players, that you can socially distance on a stage. It's a, a masterwork of a, of a piece. Um, the, the other wind serenades are only for eight players, and so those are easier to put together. Mm -hmm. The thing that makes this one uh, especially rare and difficult to perform is the fact that it uses two basset clarinets, mm -hmm. and these are pretty rare instruments. We have another video by Joe Beverly, one of our clarinet players, that, that talks about the basset clarinet if you're interested. Um, but I'm so glad that we were able to bring this piece, this really majestic, I mean, we could go on and on and on with the adjectives about how great this piece is, but you should just come and hear it uh, and, and hear for yourself how wonderful it is. Thank you so much for joining us. It was my pleasure. And uh, we'll hope to see you this weekend for Mozart's Grand Partita. <laughs>